welcome. My name is Roran. I am a digital marketing strategist. And for the last 10 years, I have worked with businesses and change makers continuously uh, amplify the way that they are making change in the world through implementing human-centered marketing and business practices. Welcome to the Real Talk with Roran show, where I get to bring on some of my favorite happy humans in the world. And we get to talk about real stuff and talking about setting real standards in our industry, not the romanticized fluff that you normally hear about business. We're getting real today. And today I am so excited that I have the amazing Ashley with the Prowess Project. And we met on, um, I think we met online. Like we were in the same network of happy humans. I think it was um, fearless leader. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And so we met on there and um, she and I, she was talking about hiring and looking for people and we just immediately clicked. And then when we chatted, she was like, yes, I want to help women be able to get back into the job market and continue their brilliance as mothers and as just awesome badass women along the way and simultaneously and this is where I was like yes I need you on the show because lord have mercy I talk about this all the time is like you hire on culture and then you hire on skill set emotional intelligence like that's like the buzzword that's going around right so sister uh, if I could tattoo that to my forehead I would it is (laughs) It is shocking to me that that is this revolutionary thing. You spend, what, eight to 10 hours on the low end with people that you work with? It is just bizarre to me. But anyway, we can get all into that. (laughs) We're going to get all into that nitty gritty stuff today. Um, But so to get started, the goal, so our goal for today, and when we're talking about setting real standards, is talking about this shift, right? Like, the millennials, Ashley and I are like millennial generation. We were kind of the guinea pigs of this shift in mindset of, of um, being part of a company for culture versus just skill set. And I think um, upper management and leaders are recognizing as a lesson learned that you can't just treat human beings like machines. We're not. That's that's not that's not what we're there for, right? And um, it's a shift. So we have this, to set the scene, we have this whole generation that is entering the market, the Gen Zers, right? They are what we call the digital natives, meaning they process information completely different than the predecessors. And I will set the scene on this, and then I would love to, I'm going to introduce Ashley and um And then we can really get into the nerdiness because we are like itching to get in there. So the setting of the scene is that this is a whole new audience that is there. It's the new way of processing. And when I say processing, people don't realize this is that there is a analog mindset and then there is a digital mindset. So, and this is purely based on the generation and lived experiences that you have been born into that makes the way you perceive the world very different. An easy example is if you've only stayed in the same town or the same state or the same country, you're going to have a very different experience than if you have been a person that has traveled around the world, aka cultured air quotes on the jargon that is being thrown, right? And uh, so in the digital versus analog, it's even more drastic. In traditional analog, we process based on what we see and hear. And that is a human trait across the board. Human beings process information based on lines and shapes. If you ever take an art theory, it's lines and shapes and stuff. So when you're analog, you are processing information based on how that person acts, walks, and acts, walks, and talks, and their look of their skin. That is why you hear a younger generation say things like, why is racism still a thing? Why is ageism still a thing? Because in their brain, they actually don't process information like that first because how they grew up was chatboard. They saw a username yes. and how yep. they talk. So analog generations we process by how you look and then we process by how you talk 
um, which is like, don't judge a book by its cover conversation kicks in, right? Yes. But yes. in the digital, it's a how you talk and then how you look conversation. I love that. I never had anyone break that down for me before. And it makes so much sense. I love this. Um, adding this to my, <laughs> my explanations, I'll give you credit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so that's the scene that we're setting into, right. And for the last 10, 15 years, we have kind of broached this, haven't touched yeah. it. A lot of leaders come to me and say, um, I don't know how to talk to millennials. Millennials kill everything. And I was like, we literally just changed mayonnaise to aioli. It's just a rebrand. Welcome to my life as a marketer. Like I just reshifted your perspective. Right. And so we are, it's, it's a shift of mindset, right? Like the tide is changing. Change is constant in our world. And so I'm going to set the scene of, for those that are listening is that we are hitting recruiting season. This is technically this is going to make me feel old, but um, any the, the generation coming into the workforce this year, May 2021, was born after 2000. No. Are you serious? Yes. I was <laughs> born after the year 2000. I mean, I guess I could have done some basic math, but like, wow. <laughs> that is, it, it, wow. Wow. Right, That's like to shocking. you and I, it's like 2000 was like a day ago. Right, 100%, 100%. Yeah. Like, wow. Right? That's insane. It's, and that's insane, right? And so the goal for this episode is for us to explore um, how this changes the way that we do business, how it changes, because Business owners, we always hear, and as a marketer, it's like revenue, revenue, revenue. How many customers can I get through the door, right? But do you realize, even as a product-based company, the other part of the lifeblood of company is not just the amount of customers through the door, but the employees that are serving your customers. Because it's no longer just, here's a cup. It's a, how is this cup getting delivered? Who am I talking to on that Facebook Messenger chat, friend? Like, I, like, I will be, there will be customers messaging you at odd yeah. hours of the night asking these questions and they expect you to talk to them. Otherwise you're going to get that really scathing review on social somewhere, right? 100%. And when they expect an answer, they expect a real person. They expect someone with emotions. They expect someone who is thoughtful, someone who also is very aligned with the brand. It's all about the full on experience now, unlike it has ever been before. Exactly. And taking care of your people is more powerful than anything else. And like, and like an example is the WeWork debacle. I'm going to tease yeah. a little bit <clears throat> before we go in. It's like, the WeWork debacle is like the perfect example. They sold an experience, a WeWork experience. They had a gold. I like saw briefly the documentary and I'm like, this is everything wrong with culture that you should not do. Like that was like my feelings of it. I was like, hmm, ooh, friend, no, ooh, ooh, yeah. ooh. Like that was, that was my face the whole entire time. And uh, we'll talk about, we could bring up different examples, but to get started, Ashley, please introduce yourself and the Prowess Project. I did a brief intro at the beginning, but I want people to hear from you on what y'all yeah. do because you are leading the charge in shifting. And it starts with who you bring to the table. Because like we talked about earlier, who represents a company is equally as important as the brand knowing who it is as a human being. Right. So incredibly key. And I just want to say thanks so much for having me on here. I mean, we're what, 10 minutes in, and this has been so fun already. Um, so a bit about me. I am Ashley Connell, CEO and founder of Prowess Project. And I started my career ten, uh, 15 years of B2B tech marketing. So um, woke up one day and was like, wow, I had been making all of these decisions because of this background anxiety that I had of how I was going to continue this career that I loved, that I moved across the world and back for, 
and then also have children someday. So did um, some digging, according to Harvard Business Review, if a woman's out of the workforce for just three years, she loses a total of 37% of her compensation power forever. And this happens to 43% of women. Insane problem that is that there is not a solution for. And then um, it, here comes COVID-19 and we saw 5 million women in the past year get pushed out of the workforce because they couldn't manage both a career and um, childcare with daycares being closed. So anyway, um, I, I wanted to solve my, my future problem in that and how I was going to balance it. So I went out and talked to, this was two years ago, went out and talked to hundreds of women who were in this position who had been out for two years um, and were trying to get back in and all they could get were unpaid internships. And these were educated, uh, experienced women. And the, what I realized and what they told me they needed was their biggest barrier to reentry was confidence. And again, skilled, experienced, educated women, what they needed was a clear path that took them from home to hired. And so that's what we built with Prowess Project. It's an integrated platform that st first starts with upskilling, so remote work, project management, the latest technology, then goes into competence, emotional intelligence, career planning. There is a professional network um, of women just like them. And then while they're going through that journey, we are gathering hundreds of data points on them on not just their skill and expertise and what they can do, but also their communication style, their learning style, their values. Their, uh, it, it really creates at the end this full holistic profile of these women. And that's how, what we use in order to match them up with companies and jobs. And so and we have just amazing. seen- yeah, thank you. That's amazing because that's like gold. That's like gold stuff that um, businesses, like I've had business owners say, I want to hire these people, but there's these very specific mindsets, personality yes. traits, et cetera. Yes. And then very often, because I work in the role of helping uh, businesses not only build the strategy, but also build the system and the team involved in their digital marketing departments. Like, right. Like, cause not everybody has the luxury of having a CMO come in yeah. or like stuff like, right. A lot of these businesses scale literally within a year and then they have to go from one or two people to suddenly five to 10 people and then have zero systems in place. Right. Like it, it's like fly by the seams of your pants. And I was like, once you hit 10 people, you cannot fly by the seams of your pants. Right. Well, and think, I mean, average, it takes 52 days to hire someone on average. Like worse days. Than, uh, that's worse than like the real estate flip over. Right. Right. It's insane. And, and then, um, and the average amount that it costs or the minimum, I'm sorry, is, is $7,000 per, per person. And so we just saw this big problem. And when we were building prowess, yes, it's all like very mission first, but we knew that it took two to tango, that we had to create the best solution out there for hiring managers too. So regardless of the mission, our product and is, is top of the line. And we're seeing that it's cutting the hiring process in half. It's cutting the ramp up process in half because we're really looking at the emotional intelligence match as well as the skill match. So, right, like you, the learning curve is there. The question is how effective can you shorten that learning curve, right? And yes. and part of it is like systems of hire and then training that person. So I fit more on the training side, right? Like once you find the person with potential, they have to have a system where that diamond in the rough actually gets polished to be a good, happy human and fully optimized right. and set up for success, like key language, right? Set up for success along the way. And I love that because like, you're talking about hiring managers, not a lot of businesses have hiring managers either, right? Like sometimes yeah. the sometimes the hiring manager happens to be like the COO or the direct say. managers, right? Yes. Like the direct managers are like, here, you do this. Like the CEO is like, oh, and they're interviewing all of it too, right? Like, and um, there's not a huge process. And so you're kind of like shrinking the risk factor. 
right? Exactly. That is exactly what we say to them. And again, it's all based on data. It, we have a behavior scientist who helped us like build all this out and our COO, her background psychology. And so it's based on, hey, let's look at, at, at people who work well together. What are the key factors? What is that per- perfect like puzzle piece fit? And right. let's help you find that. Not right. like, hey, I, I know how to do Google ads. Like, or, or I am this Myers-Briggs personality type because. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And in, in what we found that was super key in doing all of this is it's one thing to say, I am organized and another thing to show you are organized. And so that's, what's been really interesting throughout this process is our talent which again, we're starting with these women returning to the workforce. We're going to expand exponentially, uh, but they have to show, like they have to show throughout this program that they're organized and we're gathering data on that. So it's, it's, it's not self-reporting. So anyway. Yeah. I love it. And I love that because like the biggest fear. So let's talk about a little bit about hiring and like the biggest fear and like going into this next generation. Right. So let me give some well, I, everyone that knows me is I'm a history nerd and I am like that nerdy human who's like able to see shifts in social discourse in the people's court of opinion that I call social media. And I'm able to instantaneously give clarity on it because I'm like this history nerd. And I'm like, this is history repeating itself just in a modern era. Right. And in order to I love Brene Brown. So uh, as she says, in order to own your story, you have to actually understand what the heck is your story, right? Like until you own your confidence, you can't do that. So let's talk a little bit about the, the shift that is coming in, right? Like it is about culture first, and then it's about um, skill set. And you've just described that, how you guys are tactically able to do that. And it is help satisfying this big need. Like if you are a manager, a, um, a owner, CEO owner, any leader, right? This deep fear that I often hear from my clients is I am afraid that I'm going to bring whoever this person is, uh, on Mm -hmm. and they are just doing the work for the sake of doing the work. Right. Yep. Phoning it in. Yep. Yeah phoning it in and like, how do I make sure that the person that I'm investing in, because it's not just a 7,000 average $7,000 to find the person. And then you add on like what an average payroll is, which is then you're hitting easily a hundred K, right? Like, so after all things are done and dusted benefits, salary, et cetera, entry to medium pay level, whatever, you're looking at least between like a hundred K. There's a reason why we say payroll kills a business at the end of 100%. the day. 100%. I mean, for turnover, the the average amount of turnover cost is 250% of someone's salary. Right. So if like your average, so let's say like um, digital marketer coming in, like with like two to three years of experience, decently doable, you're looking at like um, 60 to 85K, right? Like that's like the typical range in Austin. And, um, with that times that by 250,000. So that's like 300,000. That's like a CMO. Yeah. Easy. Or yes. more than a CMO. That's like, losing. That's yeah. If you lose that person within six months or, or not even it, actually period. So yeah. it, it it's wild. Right. And the average turnover time frame is two years. Right. And is this is really? the thing about cult. I yeah, it is. Or at least like the like two years ago, that was like a huge thing. And like, and um, I will share a narrative on that because like I have uh, my, I have clients that ask me this question of like, how do like, cause one of the, the thing that I do is I build the system and then I trained the people and I also te- like find, help them find all the people, right? And they're like, am I investing in training that singular person? I was like, no, because the reality is the average turnover rate is two years what I'm building you in a system is so that as people come in and out, they are supported and set up for success. And you cannot, you do not lose the cost of that person that grew up with it, who has all of this 
history and knowledge like that doesn't go away when they walk out of the door right like you are that, creating that a repeatable system. yes blueprint for them that they can use forever i love it absolutely love yes. it and that's what i do right because of that two-year fear but let's talk a little bit about history of this two-year fear and why all of this is happening and why and then how we can move forward with it right so i'm i'm going to bring my nerdy history self to the table and say the reason why there's a two-year switch is because we fail to acknowledge that work is not the end-all be-all answer <laughs> yep there's that's one truth bomb i'm also notoriously known for truth bombs right so i i preface with i'm talking about history but i'm also talking truth bombs so <laughs> it is we're, we're we fail to realize that and so people we are in a society that is highly career focused right? Like if you're to your point, you spend eight hours a day, you spend more time at work than you do with your own family. So Easily. a lot of people are stuck in this living to work mentality. And they hit the two year mark, not because that they have outgrown their potential within a company. It's usually because of two things. They either realize that this is not what they wanted to do, aka they have been living to work versus working to live. And then two, the culture of the company is not supporting them in success to grow. So like a simple thing called, we call team member reviews. Like mm -hmm. I saw a crazy statistic the other day that was like, only like 30, 40% of companies actually do um, like annual reviews. And I was like, I used to meet, do like monthly reviews with my team quarterly. And then my CEO had weekly team development meetings, right? Like we did the whole shebang, right? And like that's, but most companies don't do even annual reviews. Like it's wild, it's right? Crazy to so, me. So, cause it's, it, and it's like, people are like, why is that? And I was like, because talking about human beings is hard. Yep. Humans are, not, are messy. As one of my great friends, Marisha Murphy says, humans are m messy, yes. right? And there's a lot of leadership development that takes in to be a really great like leader because the difference mm -hmm. is that, and that feeds into this problem of, of an, a team member not feeling seen and heard and growing successfully. Cause we talk about, there's like the, my, um, my uh, coach Kimberly Colbertson, who helped me in my agency build our company culture. She said, there's four competencies. There's compensation. There mm -hmm. is culture. Does your company mm -hmm. actually have the culture that we align with? Is that person actually making the impact and are they mm -hmm. growing themselves, right? Like you have four levers to pull in your comp in your total package that you are offering to that person, right? And how you show these four levers will decide whether or not that person is going to stay with you longer than two years, right? And if you're a scaling, growing business, you're not trying to do a rinse and repeat every two years, especially at the cost of 250,000 on that person's salary, right? Right. So right. how do you start of like, and it, it's like, how do you start that? And it starts with recognizing that it's human and that I want to preface with the mindset that as we deeper dive and nerd out for those of you that are listening, you're going to feel resistance at some Absolutely. point in hearing this it's conversation with us. Yeah. It is, right. But it's it's the, the, the breakaway factor is um, you are a leader, not a manager. Because the big yes. thing that feeds into this whole big problem that we're coming on is um, managers shuffle and manage people. And it feeds that humans are machines Mm -hmm. theory that has mm -hmm. been around since the industrial era and if you are wondering what i mean go and google workhouses in victorian era and you can see what i mean right like people try to understand racism and i have to say it, it's when human beings were dehumanized and we have to come back from a race of people being dehumanized right and so when you say what when i say owning that part of our story of 
why there is this transactional thinking and there's fear language of you losing your job to a machine is because of the Victorian workhouses that dehumanize human beings to be equivalent to the thing that makes that sewing machine run. So if you are interested in learning more about that, Google Victorian workhouses and take a deep breath and maybe have some wine with you along the way <laughs> to learn more. But that's that's where we're coming from, right? We're yeah. coming from a hundred plus years now from that. Like the pendulum is swinging back to being human because before that point, people were human beings or mostly, I mean, slavery and all that stuff aside, like mostly for employed, right? But the language in the Victorian era was the employed. And it was not until like the 20s and 30s that it switched to employee. The employed is a mass of people not recognized of being human. The employee is focusing on the individual. Like that's what shaped yeah, like that's yeah. Our, that's like our background of our history. And <clears throat> to be a manager is to manage people, but to be a leader is to continuously help that individual, that employee or individual contractor grow and Absolutely. continue doing better. Because like, if you're asking me, I'm afraid of hiring someone that just asks me all the time what they should do don't be a manager be a leader <laughs> well and and honestly if you think about it this all can be nipped in the bud through communication at the very beginning when we start a um a, a engagement which is one of our talent joining the company of another one we have multiple guides and it will be like your your first meeting guide and it's not questions like um, when, uh, tell me more about the technology. No, it's not like that. It's how do you like to receive information? Are you a text message person? Are you an email person? Are you a Slack person? What is the urgency? How does this, how do I provide you information in the best way that you're going to receive it? Are you auditory? Are you, are you visual? Because by knowing that at the beginning, you're setting yourself up for success yes. and talk and, and it's such easy things like this and then document it, have it. So you have it somewhere and know that, oh, okay, my manager, like for me, exa for example, don't text me unless mm -hmm. your arm is falling off. Like that is a boundary that I have that text is for like friends, family, work is email. Like right. that is just me. Yeah. And I make that really clear. Um, and we don't have that issue. And it's that, those little resentments, it's just like micro resent, resentments, which cause the massive um, divide between an employer and an employee, or as you said perfectly, a manager and an employee, because the, it, the relationship was not set out for success with a leadership mindset. Right. And then on top of that, it's revisiting boundaries, right? Like things are going to change. Things will shift. Like when you introduce new technology, like Slack, right? Like Slack is a different way of doing it. Um, like, what does that mean? Work hours. What does that mean? We yes. go, you go from all of your people in Austin and then you suddenly hit coast to coast. Cool. That right. is a three hour time difference. What does work-life balance there mean? If you have uh, a new person come in that is an independent contractor and not an employee, what does that mean, right? And um, like one of my favorite examples is one of my team members, She's a, she was an independent contractor. We gave her the freedom to be an independent contractor. We laid it out. We're like, this is how your taxes are going to change. This is how all this yeah. stuff is going to yeah. change. Are you comfortable with this risk involved being independent contractor, right? And then she was given the freedom in exchange for that to be a digital nomad. She traveled 51, Amazing. all the states, all the states went to the highest Amazing. point in North America and the South point in North America did amazing stuff. And then because she's an independent contractor, I was like, I can't legally control your hours, but right. I am going as a leader and a mentor, we're going to talk this through to figure out how you're set up for success. So she's a night owl. So we made it to where I need a little bit percentage of you as a business independent contractor, you have hours of activity that you are doing um, to be available for communication. 
So these sure. are like the three and you decide those hours, but like our request as a vendor for you or as a client of yours is that you're available for like three to four hours within the time frame that our team is in that time frame, right? And so she's like, well, I'm available for co- talking during these times. And then she's a night owl. So like the rest of her hours were spent um, to do work in her night owl high point, which is 4 a.m. in the morning. And our only request <laughs> was you have direct contact with our clients. Please make sure that you're doing that schedule send button in email so that they don't expect to hear from you at 4 a.m., right? Like that's a clear, easy example, but those are the expectations that we had for them. But it was because we had this one-to-one conversation with each of our team members to make sure that they were able to be seen and heard because to your point, these little like micro, these micro like, right. I like to say that when you hear big exodus implosions Mm -hmm. or explosions in companies, it's because all of these little micro, like little tears, it's like fabric or in paper. 100%. It's like they're little tears. And then when it's under heavy stress, they turn into chasms, like the Grand Canyon. And that is when a company explodes or implodes or usually implodes in that. Right. And that's what happens. And so Absolutely. it's like, you guys are setting up simple, easy structures and it's, and it's not, People are like, oh, it's culture, it's woo, it's feelings intangible. I was like, we just gave an easy example of how you communicate. Culture is about communication. It's not the things that you write on your damn platform. No, how no, absolutely not. It is not the swag. Like I'm so over everyone. We, we have enough company like tumblers, like we're done. I'm done with the tumblers, you know? Like Agreed. start valuing me as a human and then, okay. And you know, there's something that's really interesting and I'm curious to get your perspective on it. Um, So I was using the term uh, culture fit for the longest time. And someone said that actually culture fit, there's a problem with it because oftentimes companies will use the term culture fit as an excuse to hire people who are just like them. Oh, the birds of a feather and, curse. Yes. And I thought that that was so interesting. And so the the other term that now I love is culture ad. Mm. And so that really celebrates like, hey, you as an individual are bringing something into making us an even better ecosystem. And so I'm curious right. your thoughts on that as well. Okay, this is too layered. This is two layered pieces. So a simple way that I say to it is that when we look for people, we are looking for people that resound and align with how we work, right? Like it's a united mission. That's who we're attracting, right? Like it's resounding. Like we say this in marketing language, the person that you're hunting is not a target market because nobody wants a target on their back is one of my favorite quotes that um, a branding partner, Root and River likes to say. And it's your ideal audience, right? And so when we talk to our clients, it's very often, it's like, who's your ideal happy human? Like think, and I specifically frame it with, think of your five, like three to five of your favorite humans. Like everything in that experience was just like magical. It's like when the stars align, describe me that person. And they're like, but we serve so many other people. And I was like, You'll serve other people, but you're not, an ideal audience is about attracting people to you that resounds to you, Mm -hmm. not hunting a target, right? Mm -hmm. If you land on your ideal happy human, you'll naturally attract everybody else. But when you attract more of that ideal human, Mm -hmm. there's Mm -hmm. less cost of turnover, right? There's Mm -hmm. customer turnover. And the same theory applies for employees, If you nail Mm -hmm. on it. So what we did when we actually did um, our values as a company, we used traction by Gina Wickman. And Mm -hmm. I love this exercise because they actually said, just like pick your five favorite humans and describe why you love them in personality traits and values. And these are referral partners, customers, employees, and describe them to you. And then that's how you find your cohesive values in place 
right? And so when we're talking about, oh, we're trying to find a person for culture ad or culture fit, it's, it's not that. I actually say it's like, no, we're finding, we are um, looking to bring on team members that align with our, uh, with our intention in the world, which sounds and like the most wooist language ever. <laughs> But to go back to the very beginning of what we were talking about, Gen Z, that's what they care about in their next job, mission, mission right. alignment. Right. But it's it, not just a like fancy sentence. It's not the fancy sentence, right? It's no. the reason, like I, I tell clients, I was like, I tell clients this when they are like trying to describe that one sentence of who they are. And they're like, oh, you're meaning my mission statement. I was like, it's not your mission statement. Your mission statement is this fancy, overly like academic style language <laughs> words <laughs> of a sentence. <laughs> but what you do, it is the why behind why you do all that you do from now until the future. Like what is this final impact that you're looking to implement into this world? Because you created as a business owner, you created your company because you saw a gap in your industry. And you are yep. super passionate and excited about it. And that is why you are here doing what you're doing today. That's the mission statement. We, we talk about this a lot and how our mission statement is that there should be a work-life being. And you should be hiring someone, not just as, like, people need to be celebrated for what they do at home and that they have a life outside of work and they can bring that entire being to the workplace. And that's only going to help your company not distract from it. And so yeah. I love what you're saying about that because it's spot on. It's like, what is that, that big why? Right. Because that's how actually how human beings connect. So everything that we're talking about business, it's, it's businesses and I, I will actually ship. We're going to call, we're going to do some real talk standards and we're going to set this tone because I say this to people all the time. And this was uh, introduced to me by like an amazing coach who is um, really like, he's like Dumbledore when he talks to me, but he, he said <laughs> it this it. way. He's like, businesses are living organisms filled with amazing human beings that may flow in and out, just like how a living organism has cells and parts of it that moves in and out, Right. And that's the heart and soul of it. Your brand. This is why I don't actually say business or uh, companies when I talk when I talk about mm -hmm. who I work with. I work with change makers, aka the individual in there who's actively yeah. making change, helping their brand, aka living organism, continue to do the impact that it's creating in the world. Right. Like that's my it. sweet resounding yeah. thought that I like to do right? But it's living organisms. So it's made out of individual, amazing humans that uh, make our world a better place around it. Like as people come and change, your brand will evolve. When we say brands evolve, just like human beings evolve, you will also evolve based on the people that you have. And this is a really, um, another truth bomb is that because change is con constant, um, people will come in and out. So we actually yeah. change our philosophy. So there's a very traditional concept of like, you're going to be with me forever. And I also go back to the workhouse Victorian era. You are literally signing your life away <laughs> when you enter a workhouse. And so like that thing of I'm going to be with you forever is this thing, right? And however, the world has changed and people change and people evolve, people grow. And my favorite philosophy that I implemented as a business owner um, in my agency was this concept of we're seeking, and this is how I actually presented who we are in recruiting, is we're a digital marketer uh, company helping to humanize the way we do business and digital marketing for our clients so they can continue amplifying their communities. That was our original pitch. We are seeking strategic creatives because that's like the ideal mindset that we know no matter mm -hmm. what skill set that they do, that is the mindset that mindset. we need to have go into. We're, we're looking for strategic creatives to join our team. And we believe in the concept that your happy human 
let us make you an even better happy human. And then when it's time to part, we will naturally part. But at the end of the day, your legacy and how you helped our company evolve and our community evolve, that's the piece that stays. And that's it. how we set up I mean, our culture. Yeah. I, I really, really like that. I, I even took a note about describing the mindset that you want, not traits about the person. I really, really like that. Um, that might be, a, uh, instead of saying culture fit or culture ad, it should be mindset fit. Yeah. Because when we talk about it could be setting yeah. expectations and culture, right? Uh, the other part of it, and I actually just did this with a client, is I said, um, you're going to do in evaluations. Evaluations is the check-in reflection point to see how you are growing with each other. It is not designed to be like, are you're fired or you're not fired. That's not where that conversation right. kicks in, right? This is designed to be like, it's designed to be where that team member gets to see where they are, feel seen and heard, feel like they're able to contribute to be a part of the company and see how they can grow. Nailing four of the comp, all four competencies in one go, right? Like those are your four I levers. I really like that too, right? yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's all four of those things and how you evaluate them and we say it's like an evaluation and it looks like a report card, but it is designed to put quantity to qualitative measures. So what they're being rated on are the, is the mindsets of which they are hired for. So like in our company, it was like, we're hiring for strategic creative. So one of the things that they're getting created on, uh, graded on and evaluated on is how are they actually being strategic? So above average yeah. is they get grumpy at us when we don't, when we don't explain why they're doing a task. When they're below average is when they're just doing it mindlessly. Cause that was a huge pet peeve that I had. And many, many people also have the same thing. And it, it is a constant problem that university administrators deal with. I talked to a, quite a few business schools and they are all in that same thing where like they were they hear from companies to the university saying, we don't want a mindless intern. And they say that, and it's very contradictory because what people fail to realize is that the education system, here's another truth bomb. The education system was designed in the sixties and seventies to put people into factories. Again, another evolution <laughs> of that word house. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, all we How care about is test it? taking. We're yeah. like competing against China for test scores. And I was like, you do realize they're just trying to move more people into factories, right? Like that's, that is what majority of the job market is in China. I mean, it's a huge population. It's a, it has its own kettle of fish. I'm Chinese. I'm very highly aware of the whole. And it's, it's funny because like your top companies, like we're talking Forbes top 30, right? Mm -hmm. They have offices in every corner of the world. Mm -hmm. And they had to deal with cultural conversation shifts as yes. much as they have to deal with. Them. But it's all about mindset, right? Like the people that they hire in those countries are the people in mindset. Like I have a lot of my friends. So like in Japan, for example, a couple of my friends that have studied abroad in the US that lean more into like this comfortable of speaking a voice, they strategically interviewed for international companies. And they said, oh, it's because I like the international culture. But the real reason is because they naturally wanted to have a voice and they knew that they could not do that in a traditional Japanese company. It's very interesting. And, you know, it, it makes me really sad because it, based on the stories that you're saying, it makes the U.S. in particular seems so advanced, and yet the vast majority of the women who are coming to prowess, they are escaping toxic work environments. Right. And I mean, like, there's two sides of the spectrum, yeah, right? Like, right, you got Asian right. collectivist culture on one side of the pendulum, and then you got highly individualistic, macho, yes. like, yes. Top, like, what we call um, toxic masculinity, Right. Yes. And I'm going to actually do another truth bomb reflection of it, of like toxic masculinity is um, that's not the reality. People are like, oh, I hate this toxic masculinity. And I was like, 
the toxicity is not in the men. It shows up more in men because men are taught not to show emotions. But the Agreed. toxicity is this perfectionism. I have a lot of theories on perfectionism. Okay. <laughs> I feel like you got lots of things to say on that. And that is, oh, just the tip of the iceberg. We could talk so much more. And for those of you that are listening in this, right? Like we have just touched the tip of the iceberg that is happening, right? Like Ashley and her team have gone into the nitty gritty to give you a system to make it easier. But just in our conversation alone, right? Ashley's helped you get to start one of, of setting it yourself for success at the beginning, but there's so much more in just our conversation about like leadership development, evaluations for the team, growth after they start. So you avoid that turnover, right? It's not a silver bullet with just recruiting is what we're going to say. And Ashley and I are going to do a part two because we want you guys to <laughs> succeed. And that starts with the like, just taking away and peeling the bandaid and the magic curtain of perfectionism off because that is a very core root that is tied to a lot of barriers involved with people unable to own the messiness of our humanity. Yes, and we in particular at Prowess based on what we're doing, we're looking at this from a gender lens. And so I have a lot of data to, to share and even stories to share just on how that's looked at different in pressures, unfair pressures on both to both genders. So anyway, lots to talk about. Lots to talk about. Thank you so much again for this episode. Yeah, this we're going to have awesome. a part two because this, this, and the, awesome. these next couple episodes, we're going to dig deep into, and this is, just, we can't just talk about it in one. Right. Um, no. Episode. If you are interested in, if you are listening or watching this and you're like, and you have questions that you're curious on, let us know. We have these Absolutely. episodes are pre-filmed in advance, but we can definitely do a fun live Q&A session if you guys that. have all of these questions. I would for love us. that. Yeah. So comment on the video below. Thanks so much and have a great day. Bye.